All right, let me see if we, we are now live. Good morning, guys. It's Bernard Nomberg with another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live. And I know it's a little bit of an unsettling time for a lot of us right now, but we want to bring some normalcy to for at least the next 45 minutes to an hour. And I've got my friend Barry Goheen from Atlanta with me this morning. Good morning, Barry. Good morning, Bernard. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine, and I appreciate you taking a few minutes for us to take a take a little trip down memory lane for both of us. Happy to do it. Uh, Barry is a very successful attorney in Atlanta. We've just been catching up a little bit about the, I guess, the new normal, about how we're just having to adapt with the time changes, and hopefully it's not permanent. Hopefully it's just a... Uh, a temporary thing, but still very serious around the country. But we're going to bring a little levity this morning and talk a little bit of college basketball. And uh, for those of you who may not know of Barry, Barry was a year ahead of me at Vanderbilt and starred on the the, the bomb squad, as they were affectionately known for a few <laughs> years, with Coach C.M. Newton at the helm. And Barry just had a knack for finding the bottom of the bucket so many times and wrote a great book. Buzzer Beaters and Memorial Magic. And we're going to jump into this in just a minute, and I'm going to put the link in there. But Barry, since your days at Vanderbilt, kind of catch everybody up with what uh, what goes on in the Barry Goheen world these days. Well, as you as you mentioned, I, I'm an attorney in Atlanta. I've lived in Atlanta for uh, 20, a little over 23 years. I I came down uh, to Atlanta in the fall of '96 after the Olympics and practiced at uh, a law firm uh, in town for a while. And uh, I've been practicing law since since then, after practicing for two years in Nashville, after graduating from uh, Vanderbilt Law School in 1994. Uh, I, I was an associate at a law firm in Nashville. Then I came down um, where my then girlfriend, and now as of last Saturday, wife of 22 years, Congratulations. Uh, work, thank you. Was working at the time. Uh, so I moved to Atlanta in the fall of 96 and had been here since then. So I guess that qualifies me as an Atlantan. Well, Barry, you, you will forever be etched in the in the memories, the great memories of Vanderbilt Nation and college basketball fans, particularly those who were following the sport in the late 80s, as I had the pleasure of sitting in the stands for so many of those games, being a a year behind you in school, and there's so many games to talk about, and, and you you so eloquently and with detail went through here, painstakingly detail, shared those great memories in your book. So I'm going to throw out a couple of things from the book that just, I want to see how they, they jog your memory, okay? Mm -hmm. I know you grew up in Kentucky, and tell us, were you a Kentucky fan growing up, or how did you, how did you evolve into the black and gold? The answer to the question, uh, the first question is yes. I think just about everyone in, you know, growing up in Kentucky, at least in those days and the late late 70s or 80s or ever, you know, was a Kentucky fan. I think that's still the case. There are certainly pockets, strong pockets of Louisville fans, and and there's and you can be both. I think if you're distanced enough from both schools, you don't want to admit that necessarily, <laughs> and unless you know what the company you're keeping when you say that. But it's a strong basketball state. Uh, it's basketball mad. They're you know they're going through withdrawals right now, no question, uh, with not having. And I think the state tournament was maybe canceled as well, which is a huge deal, as I describe in the book also. So. You know, it's it's a big deal uh, in Kentucky. It's something like, as you being an Alabaman and a football player know, in Alabama, it's some Alabama football or football generally is on people's minds 365 days a year in, in Alabama. It's the same thing with basketball in Kentucky. So uh, those are very similar, I think, uh, states in terms of mindsets. They don't have professional teams, so the college games are very uh you know top of top of mind most of the other ba uh, basketball or football crazy states do have pro teams uh, but not alabama and football basketball in kentucky so those make the college programs the kings of the hill and that's really uh, a big deal so 
you know, morphing into the black and gold was just recruitment. You know, I was recruited by Kentucky. Kentucky at the time in particular would recruit, um, you know, the best, some of the best players in the state um, just for political purposes, honestly. You know, Joe Hall was the coach. He was a Kentuckian, a native Kentuckian. And, you know, it was, I think, considered prudent to, to uh, recruit the best players in the state. They may not, you know, may not have intended to play those players once they got to Kentucky. And that was the feeling I had that I'd probably be fighting for playing time. Conversely, uh, Vanderbilt and C.M. Newton made it clear that, you know, I had a place in the program. Nashville's only a couple of hours from where I grew up as well in the far western part of Kentucky versus about four hours or maybe roughly were elect from Lexington. So it was even closer to um, where I grew up. And of course, the academics, as you well know, are are superb. And uh, you know, all those things together, you know, made it, uh, I thought, a pretty easy decision to attend Vanderbilt. Well, Barry, what uh, C.M. Newton, as, as you and I have talked, has a special place in my heart because he was at Alabama for many right. years as I was a kid and had the pleasure of watching him in action and following his program a little bit. And then when he when he when I came to Vanderbilt, he was the head coach for you for those few years. And I just was always in awe of the man from afar. I can only imagine the 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 pleasure maybe, I don't know if that's the right word or the honor of playing for him. So talk about Coach Newton for just a minute or two and how, how it was to play for him. Certainly was an honor. Depending on how the games went, it wasn't always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, but seriously, Coach Newton is, you know, was at the right place at the right time. I think in my life, and I think a lot of my teammates would say the same thing. He had, you know, he did great things at Alabama. That that, you know, that program was nothing when he came to Bama in the late 60s, and he turned it in um, to a not just an SEC power, but a national power. And it's pretty much been a very competitive program ever since then, 50 years now. So that's, you know, that's with Coach Newton and his, his head assistant coaches, Coach Bostic and Coach you know, Wimp Sanderson, who replaced CM in the early 80s. And then, you know, when Coach Newton came to Vanderbilt, you know, I think he felt like um, – that was he was the right person to take that program back to some of the heights that it had enjoyed back in the 60s under Roy Skinner in the 70s. It had fallen on hard times, as hard of times as they're falling into now. But uh, clearly they were not um, not where, you know, people thought the Vanderbilt program should be. So he uh, came in and he recruited good people with strong character and also could play a little basketball. And it took a few years, but eventually, you know, in my junior year of 88, you know, we put it all together and made the Sweet 16. And then in 89, which was his final year, as well as my senior year, we went back to the tournament and kind of got it to a place where it, you know, became, um, if not expected, then at least not unusual for the program to at least appear in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Well, talk, talk to us a little bit about your mindset as a senior in high school and then coming into a freshman at, at Vanderbilt. At what point in your mindset did you did you convince yourself, or maybe you always had that inner um, confidence, I can play at this level. I know a lot of these guys. I played against a lot of them in high school, particularly in, in Kentucky during your high school time period. But it's a big transition going from the high school game to SEC basketball and eight and playing ACC and Big East at the time. What was it? When when was it that you really you you knew you had gotten to that point where hey I can not only survive here I can thrive a little bit on this level. That's a great question. Um, and I think in high school we played a lot of top flight competition, and being in Kentucky you, you do that. A lot. We did go to the state tournament when I was a junior, and uh, I had a good game, even though we lost our game there. As a senior, I played against the top, uh, the other top seniors, and, and actually juniors in Rex Chapman, uh, but seniors at uh, Mr. Basketball Tony uh, Kimbrough. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the top four in Mr. Basketball that year were Kimbrough, and then me, and then Chapman, and then Keith Williams, who was also Kimbrough's teammate 
at uh, Louisville Seneca, and the two of them went to Louisville University of Louisville. So yeah, we played those people, and I, you know, played pretty well in those games, and that gave me confidence that I could do that uh, at the college level. Then when I went to college, um, yeah, I got a real, I got a break. Someone else's misfortune became my lucky break. Third game of the year, the first game I ever played at Memorial Gym was against Duke, and this was the first year Duke under Coach K went to the Final Four. This was the team that had Johnny Dawkins and Mark Gallery and uh, Jay Billis. They were all seniors, and they went to the championship game and lost a little that year. But in that game, our starting guard, who was a senior, uh, was elbowed accidentally by Allery and, let, and had to leave the game, and he was down with a broken cheekbone for maybe 10 or 12 games. So oh. I was able to step in uh, and start, you know, at beginning the fourth game of my freshman year for those 10 or 12 games that he was out. And I played, you know, didn't knock it out of the park every time, but I played well in several of those games. And that and that really boosted my confidence that I you know, felt like I had the ability to play at, at the highest conference level. Yeah, that uh, being, um, being a Southpaw, how did that also, because it seemed like most of the shots that you favored or the side that you favored was your strong side sure. being left-sided, but there's not that many Southpaw three-point shooters or long-distance shooters, at least in my mind's eye back in that time period. And from a defensive standpoint, it just seems like it, it's you're going to have to flip everything, but it seemed to give you a little bit of an edge maybe at times or an advantage. And I don't know if you ever appreciated or if that ever sunk into some of the the, the game planning that Coach Newton and Bostick and the, and the coaches did with you guys. Did your being a left-handed shooter with Booker and Drought and those guys, I think all being right-handed, right. how did that factor into some of the game plan? Well, I think it did. I think it helps when you're only playing a team one time. You're on a non-conference schedule. You only play a team once. So you play Duke one time or you play North Carolina or whoever it is you're playing. Um, you now you want, you can game plan that, but I, I do think as a player, you almost assume everyone you're playing is right-handed. So that could be a bit of an advantage. In the SEC, not so much. I mean, you, you start seeing these teams, you play them twice a year, and you see them the next year or the year after that. And they know, you, they tend to start understanding your tendencies, and, and, you know, they're the same thing on the other side. We start being able to, well, Willie Anderson's going to do this, or, you know, Dyron Nix at Tennessee has a tendency to do that. Does it, you know, that doesn't necessarily make it any easier to stop them because they're great players, but... You, you do, and that's as a player, that's the challenge. You try to improve your game, work on something new, work on, in my case, being more, um, being more capable of dribbling right-handed or making shots right-handed, layups or whatever it is. So that's just part of the continual challenge of improving your game. There's a, but there may be a minor advantage in the beginning. I think that's a good point. Well, the, 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 the game that most sticks out to me and maybe for many fans is the pit game. And just watching the replays, and I'm gonna put the, the YouTube link in the notes. Oh, guess who just made an appearance, Barry? Emma Harris. Oh, hello, Emma. Emma, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> You're a customer as well? For, for many, many years ago, but that's awesome yes. to see you, Emma, so thank you. He's and great. my buddy Morris up in Huntsville says to tell you hello, Barry as well as my dad watching in Gulf Shores. And guys, I'm talking with Barry Goheen. We're talking 1980s, late 80s, uh, Vanderbilt basketball. But Barry, there's so many, and we don't have time to go through all of your game-winning heroics, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll kind of <laughs> narrow it down to like 10 or 15 of them. But I want to talk about the pit game. Will Purdue fouls out late in the game? And I don't remember if it's Coach Newton or someone else told Will that this, and he was a senior at the time, that this was not going to be his last game. So set the, st set the stage for us, because this is on, I don't remember if it's national TV or just part of March Madness regional coverage. I don't remember that part, but what I do remember is the late game shots that you made. So kind of set the stage for us a little bit. I, I 
think it was just as um, the regional games or something. I don't know how it was either, though, to be honest with you. It could have been the nationwide. Maybe it wasn't. I don't, don't remember. It was a Sunday afternoon, so it was something of an early game. Uh, we had the first of two games there in Lincoln that day. Um, so we were behind by four points with 10 or 12 seconds to go after they Pitt made two free throws. So we come down, Drought has the ball, makes a really a very good pass after the man who was on me sort of collapsed over to Drought, who was driving right down the lane. He passed to me behind the three-point line. I hit a three-pointer from the baseline extended. So that cut the lead to one. One point, we called timeout with five seconds to go, our final timeout. Out of the timeout, they were able to lob the ball to Charles, I guess it was Charles Smith, who was their best player, a great All-American player. He got it. Will was guarding him and had to foul him, and that was, as you point out, Will's uh, fifth foul, so he was put out of the game. And only two people were ever going to know what was said when Coach Newton greeted him, and, and regrettably only one of those people uh, are still with us today, and it's Will. And um, so whatever they said, but yes, it certainly was widely reported that words to the effect of your your bat your college career is not over, <laughs> which is something pretty special if that's what he said. Yeah. So Will had to exit the game. Smith hit the two free throws. So with four seconds to go, a second had gone off the clock uh, before Will fouled. We're down three, and um, you know Pitt for whatever reason doesn't put on a even token pressure, which you usually see in games. They at least make, uh, you want to make the team catch the ball coming sort of toward the, the uh, toward their baseline, in other words, away from their basket so they don't have time and, no, and the momentum carrying them up the court. But they didn't do that, so I was able to take uh, the inbounds pass with my momentum leading me toward our end of the court. Uh, and I think there were four dribbles, and after the fourth one, yeah, after I had a momentary slippage, the ball almost fell out of my hand, but uh, so there was a bit of, it's almost like a head fake, which was unintentional, but it helped because the guy guarding me, Jason Matthews, I think it was, he, he sort did. of glided by, and uh, that gave me just enough of an opening to hit, to shoot the shot with about a second left on the clock, and it came, it fell through the basket as the uh, as the clock expired, tying the game and sending us into overtime. When the ball left your hand, did you have a doubt? You know, I can still remember that, what, what it felt like. Um, it, it was like a surreal out-of-body experience. I, I don't recall feeling good or not good about it. I just feel like you know, the shot had left my hand. Um, you know, a, a lot of the shots, I did feel something. You know, I felt like the Louisville half quarter, I felt like that might, might even go in, you know, or the Georgia one or others, I felt like pretty good. But this one, I didn't, it was just sort of an out-of-body kind of a thing, it felt like, it, like I was floating above the, the gym or something. You know what it probably was, Barry, was thousands of hours of practicing that or very similar shots. And it was probably all your muscle memory as an athlete just kicking in at that one moment and it just, whatever your body was new to do, it did, and it, it resulted. Now, my buddy up in Morris, uh, I mean, Morris up in Huntsville asks, because he has a, a, a rising superstar young athlete himself who shoots thousands of jumpers in his driveway and works out with the University of Alabama at Huntsville basketball team. Now, now take in, in consideration why it is not 10 years of age, but he is a sports nut. Mm -hmm. Mo wants to know what are some of your tips or drills for young players to start working on as a youngster that later may allow them to make such a crucial shot in a big game. Well, I think your point on muscle memory is good. So I mean, just you know, shoot, shoot, shoot. I mean, do do the practicing. You know, be the gym rat. Be the uh, you know, be the one that asks for the key to the the gym in the summer. You know, the sort of proverbial. Uh, Jim Rad, as I was saying, and also work on the all-around game. I mean, I, I mentioned right-handedness a minute ago. I think it's good to try to be, you know, work on your, no, don't just work on the things you're good at, which is important. You need to keep those and improve even on those. But also, if you're right-handed, 
work on left-handed dribbling up and down the court. Um, that helped me, I, and I'm sort of ambidextrous. I, I left-handed as a player, uh, as a shooter in golf and tennis, but I'm also right-handed, things like eating and writing and throwing. I mean, so I kind of do things, so it made it easier for me to kind of help to work on my weak hand, but I think those things are important. You know, just it's uh it's kind of the old how do you get to Carnegie Hall right I mean you know practice 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 and I think that's the thing that anyone should do um, and I, that practice never makes perfect contrary to the saying but it can it certainly makes you better uh, for that game for those two shots that was as perfect as it needed to be but what, but Barry what maybe a lot of people who don't follow the sport very closely back then don't know how stacked hit was of a team yeah not not that the Vanderbilt Commodores were any slouches but talk about for a minute or so who was on that other side that you guys were having to play against that day it was certainly one of the best teams we played we played great teams I've already mentioned Duke we earlier in this same season of 87 88 we beat North Carolina when they were number one in the country you know we ultimately play Kansas after the pit game. We played, you know, Louisville. We think Kentucky was always good other than the last year. But they, you know, really good teams and Pitt was one of the two or three best. And their starting five probably was the best. So they had Charles Smith, whom I mentioned, he was an all American, had a very long and productive NBA career. Um Jerome Lane was this Charles Barkley prototype, about six six, might not even been that tall, but a wide body, but very athletic, a ferocious rebounder. He famously had busted the a backboard uh, earlier that season. That still gets a lot of Sports Center play. He was a great player. Um, uh, Sean Miller, who's the been a very successful head coach. He's now in Arizona. He was the Big East freshman of the year that year, a, a superior ball handler and floor general. He was there. Uh, Demetrius Gore was a smaller forward uh, and was a strong player in his own right. And they, they just had really good balance. They had good, you know, they had a terrific front line. I mean, the front line of Smith, Gore, and um, uh, Lane was as good as it got, it got in my opinion. But they had very good uh, guard play as well, and they were just a solid, solid team. We weren't intimidated by them, but you know, we had never, to my recollection, we had never played a Big East team. We had played all these good teams in other conferences, the ACC and what was the old Southwest Conference and the Big Ten with Indiana and others. But we had never played, I don't believe, a team from the Big East. So this was the only game we played against the Big East, and they were really, at that time, probably the best conference in America uh, during that during that era of the late 80s. So, Gosh, with Georgetown and, and St. John's and that whole group and all of those phenomenal players that came through there. But Barry, I want to kind of uh, pivot a little bit and talk about, I don't, I don't remember if it was your last game or close to your last game. When you and I talked the other day, we thought we were going to talk about the SEC or maybe the NCAA tournament with the teams playing in front of empty gyms. Right. Of course, that's all been shut down. But let's talk about what's it like to play in a gym in a regulation game when there's virtually nobody there or a very, very limited crowd. It's such a different game, at least my perspective, it would be. I. That's true. I, I, I was a person that I, I kind of fed off the energy of the crowd mm -hmm. um, and I really liked that energy and even if it was energy coming from a hostile visiting crowd but it's still you feel the tension you you can you know hear the noise and you know, all the heckling and things like that but that still is a you know, that's better than empty to me um, you know, I think I described it near the end of the book. I, I sort of did a 360 and came back to the very first game I played at Vanderbilt, and that was at Clemson with a, a tournament they used to have on Thanksgiving weekend. It was, a, you know, one of these weekend things. You play two games. And uh, Clemson played the first game, which was, I think, unusual. Um, so they played and won, and everybody vacated the gym. So we played the second game. 
and there was practically nobody in the gym and maybe a couple hundred people to the best of my recollection. And it was like playing an inter-squad game or something like that. And this, and remember, as I said, coming from high school, my high school gymnasium seated 5,000 people and it was often full. So, I was going to say, and it was probably pretty packed most of those games because you were on some great teams. That's right. So this was not even, you know, just a completely different <laughs> world. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, you make your own excitement. I mean, you've got to, you've got to keep your energy level and emotional level high somewhat artificially because it's difficult to really, um, you know, to keep, keep that energy if you're not getting the boost from, from the crowd. You're probably hearing both coaches with their instructions. You're probably yeah. hearing squeaks uh, of, of tennis shoes and, and whatever inner talking is going on amongst the players, which I suspect when you, when you got a packed house, a lot of that stuff may get drowned out. Uh, oh, you don't for sure. And friends. especially at Memorial, right, where the yeah. benches are on the ends. The other example would be in the Maui tournament. So if you've seen the Maui uh, tournament, um, which has been played now for a lot of years. We played in it twice. The first year we won it, and we came back, and that was a, my sophomore year, Will's junior year, uh, and a week later we beat Indiana. And then two years later we went back, and that was at Maui, and it's in the same place it's played at now. And it's just a small high school gym. Now, it tends to be pretty full, so it's not as empty as that, you know, and Clemson seats 10,000 people, maybe right. something in their gym. So it doesn't seem as empty, and it's not as empty, it's more full, but at the same time, you can hear, just like you said, you can hear the uh, coaches uh, yelling, and you can hear, you know, all these other things that in a larger venue you wouldn't normally hear. Well, I, I want to pause for a second and welcome my friend Mitch out in California, my buddy Eric here in town. We're talking hoops basketball with Barry Goheen. Uh, Barry was one of the stars of the bomb squad for Vanderbilt in the late 80s, and I was an undergrad at the same time and had the pleasure of going to so many of those great games at Memorial. And we're getting close to the end of our conversation, Barry, and I appreciate your time, but I'm going to throw some, some, some topics, some names, some things out to you, and just tell us what comes to mind. Okay. And the first thing is the mystique of playing in Memorial Gymnasium. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I was fortunate to play in a lot of great gyms, the Palestra in Philadelphia, Indiana's Assembly Hall, Cameron Indoor at Duke, um, to name just a couple, but but needless to say, it's a biased opinion, but I don't think there's anything to beat Memorial Gym. When it's packed as it was during those years, it's just a special, special place, and um, you know, I, I sure hope, my hope right now with the program struggling a little bit is that we can get back to some of that true memorial magic that that uh, wasn't just limited to my time, of course, but has been over the last 25, 30 years. And, and of course, before I came there, just well, a special, the, special place. With the, the, the floor being raised and the benches on the ends, it just creates such a diff different atmosphere than the typical uh, game. Well, it's like a stage. I think I, I said this. We were, you know, in a great win we had against Tennessee, I'm, I'm kind of a miracle comeback when I was a freshman. I mean, we we completed the comeback, went into the uh, back in the locker room, and were called back for an encore. And I think I made the statement in the book, well, it's like a stage, so why, why not an encore back up to Memorial Gym? I mean, you're right, with the raised floor, and it's just a and when the bench is on the ends, it's just a special, special place for, to play college basketball. It, it is, and you actually brought me to my next one. I think you were down seven with 11 seconds to go against that dreaded team from Knoxville. <laughs> Take us to that spot. Take us well, to that, that memory. It, we, were, we were behind by eight with like 50 seconds to go, but without a three-point line. This when I was a freshman. We didn't, the three-point line did not come into play until the fall of 86, so this was – the 85-86 season, no three-point line. So uh, we hit a shot underneath, I think it was Steve Reese, to cut the lead to two, and he was fouled, or cut the lead to six, and he was fouled. He missed the free throw, but Barry Booker, also a freshman, came from the furthest lane to tip the ball in, which you cannot do now. You actually only, you only field three lanes now for free throws. Uh, 
defense, offense, defense. There it was defense, offense, defense, offense. He came from that fourth lane and tipped it in, so now we're down four. Amazing, a four-point play. Then uh, I think there's a walking violation on UT. I come down and hit a little shot in the lane. We're down two. And we call a timeout, 20-something seconds to go. We foul uh, one of UT's guys. He misses the free throw. And then we turn the ball over, though, after we get the rebound. So we're still behind with about 18 or so seconds to go. We foul Tony White, their best player, is a 90% free throw shooter. He misses the one and one. We come down. I have the ball. I miss a shot, maybe 15 feet, and the ball sort of batted around underneath. And it lands in my hands about eight feet from the basket on the baseline, and I, I shoot it. And Dyron Nix, also a freshman, fouls me as I, the shot left uh, my hand, and uh, the ball went in. The foul was called, tying the game. Uh, and then I hit the free throw, and we won nine straight points with a turnover, without a three-point line yeah. in 50 seconds. I've never been, never seen a greater comeback than that. I, I don't think people appreciate just what you guys were able to accomplish. Amazing. And during that accomplishment, you still had errors or miscues yeah. along the way, but were able to complete it. Um, just, just incredible. Talk, talk to me um, now. He's known for baseball. He was a year, maybe a year ahead of you, maybe two ahead of me, but he wrote the forward to your book, Buster Olney. Talk about your friendship with Buster. Buster is a wonderful, wonderful writer, a wonderful person, and who's written some very good books of his own that I hope uh, if, if uh, you have not read or, or those uh, you know attending this, this session haven't read, please pick them up. But Buster was a, was a Commodore, and uh, he... He entered, I want to say, in 82 or 83, and what he would do, he would uh, go for a year, and then I think he would set out a year and, and go work and save money to come back to pay his tuition for the next year. So he eventually graduated in 88, um, which was the, the year we went to the Sweet 16. It was Purdue's senior year. Uh, and then he worked at the Banner for a year or two, and he covered uh, – and he covered the, the Belmont Lipscomb beat, the, which the NAI beat at the time. They're both, of course, D1 now. And he got to know Don Meyer through that, the, the legendary coach at Lipscomb. And he eventually wrote a book uh, of Coach Meyer that everyone should have, which is called How Lucky You Can Be. It's the last book he wrote from maybe eight or ten years ago. Uh, I'd strongly encourage people to, to buy that. But I got to reconnect with Buster in that. We, uh, I'm, I'm chairman of the Atlanta Tip-Off Club. We give out the Naismith Trophy to the college uh, players and coaches of the year, men and women. We're still doing that, by the way, this year, even though we have no Final Four to, to, to give them out within. But I connected with Buster through that. He wrote the book. Uh, Don Meyer was our outstanding contributor to basketball, which is someone we, we also choose every year. And uh, kept in touch with him through, through that. So when this book came up, knowing that he was such a good um, good writer, has done so many great things, as you say, in, in baseball, but also in sports generally, I reached out to him to ask if he would write the forward. And he literally did it the next day. He's like, I can't thank you so much. He immediately sat down and wrote that forward uh, and sent it to me, uh, which was very nice of him, uh, given how busy he is. So Buster is a terrific a terrific guy. I'd encourage anyone to pick up a couple of books he's written. Well, Barry, that's, that speaks volumes to you and what you guys were able to do in those few years with such great memories for those who were there in person and maybe got to watch on, on TV at the time. Two last things before we conclude. One good, one, one not so good. And I was at this game. We're going to talk about Florida 1989, the tennis <laughs> ball game. Right. Take us to that period with Dwayne Chensis and all that good stuff. Well, it was really the most bizarre week, and there were a lot of those, I think, that we had. But um, on the Saturday before, Coach Newton won his 500th game. That was a non-conference game against Texas in January. It was a very good team, so it was a big win, 500th win on Saturday afternoon. We come back on Monday to practice. He calls a team meeting after practice and says, well, I'm resigning effective at the end of the season to go become the athletic director at UK. And of course, we were shocked, disappointed, um, you know, all the emotions that, that go through that sort of um, 
sort of a thing and um, very difficult time, thing to process. Well, Florida was the game coming up 48 hours after that announcement. So we played Florida and then most of the starters were in various stages of the flu anyway. So that was a tough one to get uh, to get ready for. But we, uh, after a very poor first half, we, we had come back in the second half. We were down by, I guess, two. And I hit a three-pointer and was fouled with about 20-some-odd seconds to go and hit the hit the uh, free throw. So now we're up, um, well, maybe we're up one at that point. I guess that's what it was. We were down three, so now we're up one. Steal the inbounds pass, but we missed the one-and-one one after they foul us. They come back down with now about 10 seconds to go, and they miss another shot, and Cornette gets the rebound. He's fouled with six seconds to go. He hits the first free throw. Uh, so we're up two, but he misses the second one. So they hurry the ball down to try to get a tying shot, and they th uh, throw it to Shensis, the 7-2 kind of mullet-topped center, who was a very good player, but was never. And was hated by every opposing Easily the most hated he player. Visited. Easily the a, most hated player in the SEC. Yeah, he was a, he was a villain type, and he probably fed on that. He did. Oh, there's no question he did. And so they airmailed Shensis. So uh, it looks like the game was over. So to set the stage in the off season, uh, prior to this 88-89 season, he had gotten into a fight on campus at Florida with a couple of frat guys. And to, I guess, to uh, <laughs> even out the odds, even though he was 7-2, he picked up a tennis racket and started swinging it and attacking them with a tennis racket. <laughs> so everywhere Florida went that year, the tennis balls would be thrown at some point in the game, often before the game. They'd already played at Tennessee, for example. In Tennessee, they threw orange tennis balls, not surprisingly, before the game started, and they were hit with a technical foul before the game started. And it happened that I think maybe Georgia was another game they played. So um, there had been none of that in our game, but now it looked like the game was over when that ball sailed out of bounds and two tennis balls came out of the stands. But actually, one second remained on the clock. The official called a technical foul. Shensis himself hit the two technical foul free throws to send the game into overtime where they won in overtime. And they won the SEC title by one game over us when all was said and done that year. So crushing, crushing loss. Um, very bitter, difficult to digest, especially coming on the heels of Coach Newton's resignation. Very hard times. Well, it's it's, and I don't want to end on a on a bad uh, memory, but if you're just joining us or you watch us on the replay, we're going down uh, Vanderbilt basketball in the '80s with Barry Goheen, who just had a knack for finding the bottom of the basket time and time again. And I've never seen another person hit a basket at the end of the first half and then at the end of the <laughs> second half to end the game. And you know the game I'm talking about. It's the Louisville game. And it is just an uncanny game that you had. Again, maybe some of that muscle memory. But as we finish up our talk, Barry, I want you to take us to that game and the feelings of what was going on. Yeah, I, I think you may have said Georgia. I meant Georgia. I think you said I mean, Georgia. But, but, I'm I think sorry. You, but that, that's okay. Um, but yeah, that was a very a bizarre game. So at, at the end of the first half, Georgia hits a free throw, and you know I just decide. Excuse me, one second. I just. Decide. Sorry about that. No so worries. I, so I just I hit about a 50 footer from be, just beyond half court to send us into the locker room with a slight lead, and. Um, you know, and I'll never forget, you know, Coach Newton uh, at, at in the halftime locker room says, he said, well, you've got to save those shots because there's nothing more irrelevant or insignificant in life than the halftime score. So I said, oh, sorry, Coach, you know, sort of tongue in cheek. Right. Well, so we come to the end, toward the end of the game, and, and Georgia has the lead of two, of two points. And. Derek Wilcox and I get sort of mixed up with about 30 seconds to go or so uh, in the backcourt, and we turn the ball over. Again, a turnover. And we, we call it the timeouts call, and then we go to the bench, and I said, like, we get the ball back. I'm going for a three-pointer. I told him that. I just felt like, you know, let's just go for it. 
and so they uh, we they they hit two free throws. We hit two free throws. So the lead is still two with about about 18 to 20 seconds to go. Georgia inbounds the ball, and their fine guard Patrick Hamilton breaks wide open and uh, on the other end of the basket. Because I was supposed to be guarding it, but I, but I had stayed in the other end to try to steal the ball. If he lays the ball in, they probably win the game. But uh, he missed the layup, and they uh, one of their guys comes from out of nowhere for a like a one-handed slam dunk um, put back, and he missed it. It banged off the back of the rim, probably 15 to 20 feet into the into Barry Booker, uh, the arms of Barry Booker, who drove down the right side. I had, I was on the other side, the left side, and I was wide open from about 12 feet or so, and I was kind of frantically waving my arms to have Barry pass me the ball, which he did. Um, and by then, Georgia, was one of the Georgia players was closing on me a little bit. So it wasn't quite as open as it was uh, a couple of seconds earlier, but it was still a makeable shot from maybe 12 feet. But I dribbled out behind the three-point line, and Hamilton – tried to steal the ball once he recovered from his blown lay layup and he missed. And then when I turned around from his steal, I was kind of open behind the three point line and, and, and shot and made the shot as time expired to give us a one point victory. Well, that that's what was so remarkable to the fan watching was you catch the ball, as you said, about 12 feet out, but then you back up and you've got Washington on you. Did you actually, when you got behind the three-pointer, are you looking at the clock as well? Because it looked yeah. like you glanced away <clears> to make sure to, to confirm how much time. And then, as we all know, it, it went through the hoops. And you exactly. said, Randy, yeah. Randy exactly. Uh, the Fury. Say there's again. a photograph in the book, as a matter of fact, that captures that moment where I'm Let's looking. see if I can find it. <laughs> I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the clock. It's really a great photo. Uh, I've got the book in front of me as well, but you can... Uh, here we go. Here we go. You can. It's a great photo because you can see. Yeah, that's the one. You can see the score as well. Five seconds yeah. to go. With we're behind seventy-five, seventy-three, and you can see what I'm. I'm looking at one of the other scoreboard clocks. There's so many in Memorial, just to make sure there's time to pull this off while I'm still dribbling. And um, so that's that's the photo. So I did look up to make sure there was enough time. And um, you know, that's one of those that. I'd probably been run out of town if I'd missed it. <laughs> well, let, let me, let me, there, there's so many of these, these great endings, Barry, but here's what I want to ask you. I've always heard that slowing the game down for the athlete is such a key in these type moments, whether it's naturally gifted to you or it's something you develop over time is the ability to slow your heart rate appreciate your circumstances and know what you got to do and then go do it. And what I want to ask you is, how did you develop? Was it inherently just part of your DNA? Is it part of your training with Coach Newton or your high school coaches? Or, or give us an idea of how you were able to, for so many of these times, slow the, what I'll call slow the game down. Well, I would give a lot of credit to Coach Newton, you know, for the college stuff because – Every single day, without fail, if you had any of my other teammates here right now, they would back me up on this. We would have what we called game situation scrimmaging at the end of every practice, or at some point in every practice. Coach Newton would be a memorial. Coach Newton would say, uh, put you know, two minutes on the clock and we're down four. Or put, and the next day it might be there was a minute and a half and we're up six. You know, whatever it is, right. different situations. So you could never, other than if tennis balls were involved, never encounter a situation that you had not encountered or at least tried in practice. And, of course, as we've talked about, you know, simulating it in practice in an empty gym, there's not quite as the, um, the attention, the energy, the emotion, but it still helps, you know, to know what you need to do. We had a better record in these kind of close games than we did overall, and I think a lot of that is due to, uh, practice, you know, becomes ingrained in you and, and it develops a certain level of confidence. So I had, you know, I had a lot of these great game winners uh, or game tires or whatever they were, but by no means was I the only person to do, to have these game winners. You know, when I was a sophomore, Purdue had a turnaround 
jump shot uh, against LSU to turn a one-point loss into a one-point win. Uh, you know, Booker had huge shots in the Louisville game and game winners uh, at, at Ole Miss that really broke our streak of, of kind of uh, in 88 when we were 0-3, and, and that's when we won seven games in a row from there with his game-winning uh, shot. You know, we just had everybody made big plays. That might, might have gotten more attention uh, because of just the, the sheer drama or the, just the weirdness of some of those, but everybody made big shots and big plays, and that was, I think, a lot uh, due to Coach Newton and his staff. Yeah, and I think that that translates for really any successful player. It's not just the athletic ability, but it's how to use that game situation and just slowing things down and appreciating what needed, needs to be done. Well, Barry, I could talk to you all day, but I know we both got a lot of stuff to do, and I, I appreciate you spending the time with me this morning, just bringing a little bit of that memorial magic back to life for a few minutes and sharing it with the folks out there. And uh, thank you, my friend, for, for sharing all that with us. It's been a real pleasure. Right Any time. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, guys, this will conclude us for another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live, as we try to do, try to bring you interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And this certainly was a fun one for me, and I hope you guys enjoyed this as well. And we'll try to come to you again next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and this will be it for today. Hope you guys have a great week. Take care. Anchor down.